Siobhan McDonough, let's start with your childhood. How would you describe it? I would think it was a, it was a, a great childhood. To come from an Irish Catholic sort of family, big families on both sides, lots of aunts and uncles coming and going, cousins, ups, downs, all the rest of it. But my mum and dad were just steadfast, completely reliable. I mean, this is a bit sick making, but every day, either my mum or dad, depending on whether my mum was working because she was a night nurse, they would kneel at the bottom of our bed and we'd say our prayers. So wow. I, when I look back now, I think that's probably what makes both myself and Margaret confident and I, I see the trauma now of with families that I deal with of constantly moving of you know not being kind of reassured by a routine I think routine's really important for children is Catholicism still a big part of your life yes I mean I'm a I'm a very liberal Catholic but I'm a, a church-going Catholic and it it kind of it's also about my sense of community and belonging and being part of things. You mentioned Margaret, who is your sister, who was a very big figure in the Labour Party, uh, not a Labour MP like you are, but was a general secretary of the Labour Party. So at what point in your lives did you both decide to commit your lives to the Labour Party? I'm not ever sure that you make decisions like that. You ease into them, don't you? Um, I look back and I think I was just a bit of a gobby teenager and that, um, you know, we would always sit down on a Sunday and my dad would always say, can we not row about the priest's sermon? And the answer to that was, of course, no, because we always did row about it. So, you know, it was a house of newspapers. It was a house of watching the news what on the What newspapers? Um, the Daily Mirror. Yeah. Uh, and uh, watching the newspaper, you know, reading the newspapers, watching the news, always discussing things. It was kind of very part of that generation of Irish kind of culture. And you live with your sister now. Yeah. Because that's a close relationship. Yes. I, I, I mean, it's hard to tell, isn't it? Because if like, that's your life, you don't see it as unusual or anything. But she's an extraordinary person. And uh, yeah, she prevents, she m m ensures that I live in a civilised fashion because I'm not quite so sure my house would be as nice if she wasn't living in it. You're not, you're not that tidy. I am tidy because I have to be tidy. <laughs> Do you ever miss the fact that you're not in a relationship with, with a, a partner? Are you happy living with your sister? I'm happy living. The, I mean, I think I've always been fortunate and living the life that I wanted to. And I've got great friends, great family. I love my job. I kind of, you know, sometimes you can look at other people's close personal relationships and just think, oh, God, thank God I'm not, you know. And I suppose... I like doing what I'm doing and perhaps I'm selfish. I don't, just don't compromise on that. So you are a Blairite. Yes. It is not always that fashionable in the Labour Party. It was certainly like not fashionable in the last sort of almost decade. It might be creeping back into fashion a little bit now. Mm. But you have never gone sailed with the political wind in the Labour Party, have you? I suppose it's, it can be the only way that you can be. If you, you know, if that's who you are, that, that's just how you do it. I mean, I kind of passionately believe the Labour Party has got to uh, build a broad coalition, uh, putting together the people who don't have much together with the people who have something, because without a big, broad message, you're never going to win. Uh, and what I want to do is to win to change the world. The Labour Party can, its worst tendency, it may happen in the other parties too, I don't know, but I, but I know for certain that happens in the Labour Party. It can have elements in it which almost tries to bully you out of your thought process if it is not in fashion at the time. Were you ever subject to that? Did you ever feel hurt by that? I suppose I'm just a bit too belligerent myself to, um, to be like that. I mean, I think you have to be careful because sometimes, you know, other people's views are the right ones and you aren't necessarily always right and... But um, I suppose I'm just extraordinarily lucky in that I've got great friends, a great constituency. And so I think often for MPs, they don't actually have a big support network behind them. So they may fear, you know, the period that we've been through may fear losing their job, not being reselected, may fear aggression from their party meetings. Well, you know, I never really had that. 
So I was just a bit luckier, really. You've had controversial pl political periods. Um, when Tony Blair uh, stood down or when there were moves to get Gordon Brown in, you, you didn't want Gordon Brown to be the next leader. Do you, what, do you look back on that period after all the, oh God, drama and chaos that has engulfed the Labour Party subsequently and think, oh, maybe I was a bit harsh? No. <laughs> No, I think um, the point of the Labour Party is to be successful at elections and bring about changes, whether it's taking kids out of poverty or pensioners out of poverty, building hospitals, building houses. That is um, our preeminent purpose. And so, I mean, it's nothing personal in this. I just felt that Gordon Brown was a great chancellor but in the 21st century, and it may be completely unfair that he was going to find it extraordinarily difficult to be a prime minister in a 24-hour news media world where you have to be out there all the time. You can never hide. You always have to have a view and understand that some of the things you decide are just going to go wrong. And I, I think that he is a man of great thought, uh, great ideas, but it's very different being the number one to being the number two, isn't it? And I, I just felt that's where, it, where, well, that wasn't where his skills lied. What would Siobhan McDonough MP be doing as a job now if she wasn't Siobhan McDonough MP? Well, I think I might be signing on. I'm not sure <laughs> that I'm employable. I mean, I, I, uh, prior to being an MP, I worked for a housing association and I ran schemes to help homeless families find accommodation. So hopefully there would be room for me in that sector. Um, I have very few technical skills, which I think make me difficult to employ. But I hope I'd be out there doing something entrepreneurial, kind of on the social side of things. And what do you do? Because, well, first of all, isn't it difficult? Because you were elected in 97. That's a long time. Do you feel institutionalised? Is it? Do you have to fight against being institutionalised? Because it uh, is an institution parliament. It is, uh, but I suppose my link to the constituency has always been greater. So I've never really been part of that. You know, you know what it's like. You spend all that time trying to get elected as an MP, and I, I lost in eighty-seven and ninety-two to only want then not to be a constituency MP, but to be a PPS like a, you know. A, kind of an assistant to a minister or be a junior minister or become a minister. And I never really felt driven to do any of that. It's, a bit, it's always been about, you know, kind of practical idea about how you could improve things. I mean, I was John Reid when he was Home Secretary and Defence Secretary, his PPS, and that was a great time because he's got such a big brain and so many ideas. Let me make this confession to you. I didn't want to do any of that either. I just wanted to be a constituency MP. But the psychology in that place is, well, your mates are getting promoted. Yeah. Why aren't you getting promoted? So, yeah. so I thought, oh, maybe I should get promoted. And then it, you know it's not going to make you happy. It doesn't make you happy. But you, I found it difficult not to stick doing the thing that made me happy, which was being the constituency MP. How do you fight against that massive gravitational pull to, you should be on the ladder, you should be on the ladder? I don't know. I suppose I never thought anybody would put me on the ladder, so it never really bothered me very much. And when Tony Blair was um, uh, Prime Minister and when we had a Labour government, I was just willing it for six, wanted it to be a success. Just, you know, I would go and see him and say, Tony, have I, I've had this idea about antisocial behaviour in the police, or I've had this idea... And he probably thought, oh, not that woman again, you know, about... Uh, so there was always lots to do. And I, I also feel that I was joined the Labour Party in 1976. How old were you? Uh, 16. Uh, and the, you know, things were really bad. You know, we think things are bad now, but things were bad then. And I, I've always thought, how do you make people, encourage people to feel like MPs, politicians, councillors, the Labour Party is there for them. And so that had always been far more something that I thought about and I was more interested in. Um, occasionally, I think, you know, perhaps I should have done it differently, but on the whole. What do you do in your spare time? I've got a very, I mean, I live in the area I was born in, so I've got a big social network. Uh, I go out quite a lot. I am a party animal. We do Northern Soul dance classes every other Sunday. Who's we? 
Me and Margaret. Do you? Yeah. So Northern Soul Dance Classes, that's where they like move their feet. Yeah. Like in that, yeah. That, I mean, yeah, we can't do the backflips or the, you know. But, no. but can you do the the sort of, I don't know, even, even know what, what it's On called? On a very, I'm not very good. But it, the great thing about it, we do it at a local church hall for a couple of hours on a Sunday and it makes you stop thinking about everything else. Yeah. You, you just think about, you know, gosh, perhaps I should just put my foot here or there or whatever. And the music's fabulous. So, yeah, no, it's great. When did you start doing that? A few years back, um, we went to Blackpool to the International Northern Soul uh, Finals. As there was about eight or nine of us. And we just went into the beautiful uh, ballroom and people were so nice, so friendly. There were groups of men in their 50s there for the dancing. They just got out there and they danced. And it was just a revelation. Yeah. Is music a big part of your life? Yeah. Yeah. Great entertainment sort of thing. Yeah. Do you go to gigs? Yeah. Um, uh, last week went to see Rag and Bone Man uh, at what we would call Hammersmith Odeon, but I think is now called the Aventum Apollo. Uh, um, yeah, we went to see Nile Rogers at Hampton Court back in the summer. We'll go and see uh, Trevor Nelson's Christmas Soul Party at the Albert Hall. Yes, yeah. So you're a you're a pop music fan. Yeah. Not classical for you. No, no. <laughs> uh, one of my best friends, Anne, she lives three doors up, and she loves the opera, and she's always threatening to take me to the opera. It would be a complete waste of time. Are you still that same working class girl at heart that you were born uh, into? You like to think so. You like to think your values are there. I mean, clearly life gives you different experiences and introduce. I mean wonderfully give, introduce you to people that you would never have met or travel to places so you don't stay the same but hopefully you fundamentally stay close to who you are would you ever do strictly no i'm not good <laughs> enough no uh the uh, the glitter the sequins the hair and the makeup yes the dancing not so much siobhan mcdonough it's been it's been really good fun to talk to you thank you thank, thank you, you for sharing the real me